business and capitalism are at a tipping point. Much like a seesaw stuck on its fulcrum, we've been led to believe that this can only go one of two ways. It can fall this way into what I'll call burn it all down and start over. Or it can fall this way, which is do nothing, business as usual. So let's talk about those two options. Burn it all down and start over. And with it, acknowledge everything we've grown to just disdain about business, the greed, the exploitation, the sexism, the bro culture, the homophobia, the racism, the bias, unconscious and sometimes unfortunately conscious. And get a wrecking ball, grab a can of gas, book of matches, and rebuild from the ashes. Or option two, acknowledge that business is in the business of business. It doesn't exist to solve society's problems. It exists to serve its shareholders. Nothing more, nothing less. Status quo. But what if I told you that the answer was actually a third option? The next iteration of capitalism, the future of business is actually in the middle. But if we're going to talk about the future, I think it's important that we understand the past, some of the present, or what I'll call option two, business as usual. And if you take a business class at any business school in the country, you'll hear the echoes of a 1970 op-ed published in the New York Times, written by Milton Friedman, who was an economist at the University of Chicago. And Friedman argues, a couple of those arguments are already made, business in the business of business, creative. Business exists to serve its shareholders, to make money for them. But then he made one more argument that, luckily for me, kind of forms the basis of my talk, that consumers and employees would play this pivotal role and determining the future of business. Now, oh, don't get me wrong, Friedman went in a completely different direction with where he thought they'd go, but he made the point nonetheless. Consumers and employees. And Friedman made some other interesting, decent, hypothetical on paper in theory arguments, but there were some glaring blind spots, like failing to take into account what happens when you prioritize quarterly returns to the extent that you shutter factories close plants, outsource jobs, downsize the middle class. Friedman failed to look at what would happen when we unleashed unbridled and unrestrained capitalism on the world. How bad has it gotten? Well, let's look at some statistics. Like I said, 1970, that op-ed was published. Since 1970, the minimum wage and the average, living, or the average wage has not kept up with inflation. Since 1978, the average worker pay has gone up 18%, not bad. The average Fortune 200 CEO has seen their pay go up over 1,300%. And since 1970, the percentage of wealth going to the middle-income households has decreased by 21%. To the upper-income households, it's increased by 18%. The middle class has shrunk by 11%. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. According to the Brookings Institute, the median wealth of a black household is 10% that of their white counterparts. Black entrepreneurs receive between 0.7 and 1.3% of startup capital. Women receive less than 3%. And speaking of actual literal icebergs, <laughs> our focus on profit over everything has led us to turn a blind eye to a really extractive and damaging means of production and distribution and consumption that's led us down a path that threatens our very existence. So as I throw all these statistics out at you, it's very clear capitalism is the evil in the room. It's the, uh, as we would say where I'm from in Georgia, the devil doing its work. Greed's taken over. And clearly, this pretend business guy standing in front of you with a red sport coat on is just one of those gas can carrying socialists ready to burn it all down. <laughs> but I hate to burst your bubble. I'm not. I'm actually an unapologetic capitalist. But what does that mean? What does capitalism even mean? We haven't even defined it yet. Well, according to Merriam Webster, 
Capitalism is simply the private or corporate ownership of capital goods, that is goods and services, products that we buy. As determined, price with, sorry, with pricing, production, and distribution determined by two very important words, the free market. There's nothing in that definition about a select few accumulating more and more wealth. There's nothing in that definition about exploiting others to make money. There's nothing in that definition about accelerating climate change at all costs to make money. It's simply privately held goods and services defined by the free market. And to everybody sitting in this room today, everybody streaming one of the watch parties, or everybody up that can't sleep somewhere in the future going down a TEDx rabbit hole in the middle of the night, <laughs> congratulations. You're the free market. You're the consumers and employees Friedman was talking about. You have an opportunity to reimagine capitalism through purpose, with purpose, and on purpose. We, the stakeholders, not the shareholders, the employees, the consumers, we, and this is why the system's so beautiful, have the power to reimagine, redefine, rebuild, mold, sculpt, craft, transform this malleable idea that's simply the idea of a privately held market. We have that opportunity. And there's a shift happening. I wouldn't call it seismic yet, but that shift is happening. And a lot of it's generational. Do we have any Gen Zs in here? I can't really see because there's lights in my face, but I'm gonna, I, the fun part is I actually know there are Gen Zs because uh, we still think like Gen Zs are in elementary school and middle school. Gen, the oldest Gen Z turns 28 this year. Yeah, and they showed up on the, uh, they showed up in the workforce, I'd say probably carrying one of those gas cans. Uh, and, but they also helped other generations find their voice. You know, Gen Z's now in positions of power. They're getting promoted. There's seven to eight years with them in the workforce. Some of them own their own business. And they have one other important thing, disposable income. And that other generation whose voice they help find, it's my generation. What's up, millennials? The oldest millennial turns 43 this year. I'm not that old, but I'm getting there. Um, and you know, when we got into the job market, we were the opposite. We didn't really like it. We weren't thrilled about the status quo, but we took the advice of our parents. And we just kind of kept our head down. We worked hard. We chased that promotion. We remained loyal. But then Gen Z showed up with their, um, oh God, what's a nice way to put this? Outspoken opinions about everything. <laughs> and we realized suddenly that we had this almost near majority of employees, of, cons of uh, consumers. We had an opportunity to change the future of business. And lucky for us, we didn't have to prove it in theory. We had a sample set, a growing sample set of companies that we could point to and go, look at this. See, it's possible. Because everybody says it's not possible. And then we looked and we went, oh my god, it's the B Corporation movement. It's B Corps. It's companies you know, like Patagonia, Toms of Maine, Warby Parker, Cotopaxi, Tillamook Cheese, 6,200 companies around the world in 88 countries employing over half a million people. Companies that are certified by an outside third party and how they handle corporate governance, transparency, legal protection of all stakeholders, worker benefits, living wages, time off, parental leave, social impact, community investment, a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, environmental practices that are regenerative instead of extractive, and treating customers like actual you know, human beings. We had this movement to point to. And if you still don't believe me, because you, you know anybody that took an introduction to business class knows, and I'm trying not to bore you with econ talk, but bear with me. You have you know, money coming in, what you sell, your goods, your services, your widgets, and then you have expenses going out. All those things I just mentioned, higher pay, better benefits, longer leave, investing in environmentally, you know, alternative sources, those are all expenses. So on paper, I can't be good for, good for business, can it? It has to be 
bad for business. It's bad for the bottom line. But what if these aren't actually expenses? What if they're investments? What if they're investments that help us sell more? And so I'll share a couple statistics, and I promise it's the last data set. So bear with me one more time. A McKinsey study at the beginning of the Great Resignation, September 21, found that 40% of employees were somewhat likely to leave their job. Of those that had already left, 36% left without another job lined up. Of those that hadn't taken the leap yet, 64% were willing to do so without an offer in hand. Think about that. Any parent with a young adult entering the workforce was probably the first piece of advice you gave them. Any young adult probably got that advice from their parents. It's gotten that bad. We're not even lining up other jobs. We're just quitting. And then a Qualtrics survey in 2022 found that 54% of employees were willing to take a pay cut to work with a company whose values they align with. Another 56% of employees, and this is all employees, not just the Gen Zs and Millennials I mentioned, would never even consider working for a company whose values they didn't support. And companies like B Corps and purpose-driven, mission-driven companies and enterprises and even the big corporations are figuring this out. And they're snapping that talent up. B, the B Corp community in North America grew by 36% in the last three years. And the demand is so high for the certification that it can take up to 18 months just to go through the verification process. So what then is my call to action? What are we reimagining? How do we do it? And as I look out at this room, I see different ages and races and ethnicities and genders. I see this beautiful picture that is America. And I see this beautiful picture that makes up the world's most powerful economy, or as our Gen Z friends would call it, the world's biggest influencer. So let's influence, let's lead. Let's make the business case, the free market case, the employee consumer case, the Friedman case, if you will, for businesses that exist with meaning and purpose. Let's be intentional about doing this. We can be intentional in so many ways, but we're going to focus on a couple. Number one is be intentional with where you spend your money. Reward great companies with your hard-earned dollar. If you don't support their values, if they don't align with yours, don't shop there. And I'll share three quick examples with you and how I'm intentional with where I spend my money. And I've noticed that nobody's really looking at my eyes. Everybody's looking at my shoes all day. Um, these are my Tom's Cabrillo sneakers, and anybody with a size 14 knows that I ordered every pair online because <laughs> once you see them, they're gone. They only make like one pair above like 12. So I can buy sneakers anywhere. I love these things. They're comfortable. I think they look cool, as cool as a four-year-old can look. <laughs> so why Tom's? Well, I know that Tom's donates 33% of their profits back into grassroots community organizations. I've read Tom's annual impact report. I see quantifiable, not just jargon, I see quantifiable metrics, quantifiable progress towards quantifiable and measurable metrics and goals. I know they live their mission every day and I love to support them because I'm not only supporting their mission, I'm supporting their bottom line. Next one, if you can't tell, I tried to turn it down on the coffee today, but I love coffee. <laughs> um, I can buy literally a commodity, right? I can buy coffee anywhere. But I order coffee from Cafe Campesino in Little Americas, Georgia, beautiful little town, about an hour south of Atlanta, close to where I live. I buy Cafe Campesino because I know in the late 90s, they got a bunch of roasters. They had this crazy idea. Let's get a bunch of these, these small roasters together, and let's order in bulk from these small farmers down in Central and South America. And let's not pay commodity prices. Let's partner with them. Let's pay fair market value. And over the last 20 years, they've lifted up entire communities in some of the poorest parts of the world. They've created wealth and opportunity in places where we've always exploited and extracted. So yeah, I get to drink a great cup of coffee, and I get to know that's what my money's doing. That's what I'm supporting, real change. And last, my last example is my go-to thank you gift. I just hope one day you're on my list, because you'll get Grayson Bakery brownies. Um, I can literally get thank you gifts anywhere. 
I can get brownies anywhere. I can make my own thank you card and I can make my own brownies. But I send them from Grayston. Why? Because I know in the early 80s, they saw societal issues in Yonkers, New York, where they're headquartered. They saw rising recidivism. They saw an increase in homelessness. And they thought, what can we, it's a small little bakery, what can we do to play our part? They switched to open hiring. No more resumes, no more interviews, no more background checks. Put your name on a list. When the job's open, it's yours. So I know that with every purchase I make, I'm offering. I'm not completely offering. I'm supporting dignity and hope through a paycheck to the formerly incarcerated, the formerly homeless, those cast aside by society. My purchase is making a difference. And I'll throw this disclaimer out, the fine print at the bottom of the screen right now. I don't work for any of these companies. I mean, they can send me some free brownies, but I'm not getting paid by any of them. <laughs> um, none of them, there's no commission here, but I'm proving the point of what we as consumers can do. I'm just a raving fan of these brands to the point where I'm standing on the red dot telling you about them. Literally, I do have boxes of these in my closet. Like, that's, that's what this means. So the second area of intentionality for everybody in this room, once we shop with our values, is to be intentional with where we work and what we do at work. I realize, just like my MBA students at the University of Georgia every year, they're graduating. Most of them aren't going to work at B Corps. Most of them aren't going to social enterprises, like I imagine most people in this room aren't. But they're going to good companies. And I tell them all to be change makers. Join the committee. Join the task force. Organize the volunteer event. Don't wait for anybody else to do it for you. And if you work for a company that just wants to look good and doesn't actually want to act good, well, line, line another job up first. Don't do that. <laughs> but find another place to work. And lastly, to my business owners in the room, let's be intentional with how we build our businesses. Let's do the hard things the right way. And let's remember, no margin, no mission, no profit, no purpose. Let's be responsible. But let's build great, profitable, purpose-driven companies. If we can be intentional with the things we're doing every day, we can make measurable progress. And we can reimagine a sustainable future, an equitable society, a healthy and thriving planet. And we can do it by reimagining capitalism through purpose, with purpose, and on purpose. Thank you.